Okay. Uh, Melissa came around and I think handed everyone a handout that has oh, sorry, the words to Little Drummer Boy on it. And I'm just going to preface that a little bit because it's not in the hymnal, be, be, I think probably because the story is not found in the Bible, and so there's no verse to reference about the Little Drummer Boy. But there's actually a lot of references in a way because if you kind of look back through Scripture, um, what has God required of us uh, as far as entry into heaven or, or what is it that we are supposed to give to him to, to have salvation? Nothing, right? There's no, it's not an exclusive club. It's not a membership. It doesn't matter how rich we are. Uh, it doesn't matter what gifts we have because we all have something. And so it's actually a great reminder that even if you don't have a lot of money or you don't have a lot of prestige or you figure like you're just a regular old Joe, um, it doesn't matter. Um, and so the, the story of the little drummer boy really tells that. that it's, he says, I'm a poor boy too, but what did he bring? He brought his gift. So it's biblical. All right. We got a little drummer boy behind us. So enjoy that. You'll be, if you've never seen the little box before, be amazed at the little drum here. Oh, but I need to see the words too, though. Oh, you want words? Yeah, there they are. <laughs> no, we're good. Oh, I'm sorry. He's back here. You'll hear him. Yeah. All right. Come, they told me, pa -rum -pa -pum -pum. a newborn king to see. Pa -rum -pa -pum. Gifts we bring, pa rum pa pum pum, to lay before the king, pa rum pa pum pum, rum pa pum pum. Children's service.
That's a pretty good record, about 50% under <laughs> nine. All right. All right, Kelly. season to hear the, the just the old Christmas hymns, some of the newer stuff. It's just a blessing. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for sharing, the kids for sharing. That was just amazing, and everyone who so, just organized that. But uh, just a wonderful way to just to kick off this Advent season. Um, but with that said, let's get into the Word of God this morning, because it is about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He gave to us His Word as a light in the darkness. So Romans chapter 11 as we're going to conclude this trilogy that's been running a little bit here at First Baptist Church in the book of Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're going to pick up in verse 16 this morning with a message called the Trilogy Part 3, Restoration. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 16, if you stand to honor the Word of God this morning. I am just going to read to you verse 25 right now. Verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray as the psalmist prayed that the entrance of your word would give to us light and would give to us truth and that your word be, would be the rejoicing and the joy of our heart this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. I don't know about many of you, but often most people like a good mystery, right? Right? You know, whether you like the old school days of Sherlock Holmes or the more modern, up-to-date up versions like NCIS and all those, you know, series that they have out there. But there's something fun about trying to figure out who done it. Figure out a mystery, gathering clues along the way. And let me tell you, Lisa is extremely good at it and she'll know in about, about a minute and she'll ruin the entire thing. But she, she knows who did it just right off the bat. But today we're going to talk about another mystery. As we look at this last part of the trilogy of the nation of Israel. But when the Bible speaks of a mystery, it's not like we think, like Sherlock Holmes. When the Bible says there's a mystery, the word is mysterion. And it's used 21 times in Paul's letters. And what a mystery in the Bible is, is it refers to a divine truth that was once hidden, which has now been made clear. It was hidden maybe in the Old Testament, but now it has been made clear through divine revelation to us. So when the Bible speaks of a mystery, that's what it's speaking of. And here Paul says, brothers, sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. And seven times Paul will say, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. I don't want you to be ignorant of this. And friends, oftentimes what's happening, especially in the church, is people are ignorant of the Word of God. And that's why we do what we do here. Why do we spend time going through Romans? Why do we spend time going through the Gospel of Mark on Sunday night? Why do we spend time going through Ezra line by line, you know, chapter by chapter? Because we don't want people to be ignorant of the Word of God. Because when you intake the Word of God, that's where you grow, that's where your faith is strengthened, and that's when you are equipped to go out into this world and do ministry, to love people. But he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. So what's the mystery that he speaks of? The mystery is God's plan of salvation that would come through Jesus, not only to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentile people. And if you recall, as we've been looking at Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, chapter 9, we saw the nation of Israel, their past election. God had a divine purpose for the nation of Israel. 
Then we looked at chapter 10. And what's going on with Israel today? Well, they're rejecting the Messiah by at large today. And now we come in to chapter 11, the end of it, and we see their restoration happening. But what we have observed already is God is faithful to His covenants. He is faithful to His promises. And God is not done with Israel. And what I broke this chapter down into is three things this morning. Just to make it a little bit easier for us to understand, we're going to look at first an analogy. Secondly, we're going to look at the mystery. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the doxology. So let's look first of all at the analogy. Look at verse 16 if you still have your Bibles open. Verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and were with them, became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Paul now uses an illustration from nature and a principle of the Old Testament to show us our privilege, the privilege of the Gentiles coming to salvation through the Jewish people. So he says, look, the first fruit is holy and the lump is holy. The root is holy and the branches are holy. So what we have is we have a holy lump and we have a holy branches. What is he talking about? He's taking us back into the Old Testament, into the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verses 19 to 21. It's the principle of the first fruits, okay? And what was the principle of the first fruits? God was preparing the people in the wilderness to go into the promised land, and there in the book of Numbers, he says, look, you're about to go into a land flowing with milk and honey, grapes so large that you, it would just blow your mind. He says, look, when you go into that land, what I want you to do is I want you to give to me the first fruits of your harvest, your grain, your threshing floor, the first fruits. He says, I want you to bring the first and the best to me. And we see this illustration come into the New Testament in that famous passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about the resurrection. Do you remember what Paul said? He said, Christ, Jesus Christ, was the first fruits of the resurrection. Literally meaning that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you know, never to die again. And he was the first fruits. Literally meaning there was a harvest to come. Those are the people who received Jesus Christ by faith. So look, Paul said, look, there's a first fruit is holy, the lump is holy. And he's looking at the principle of the first fruit. You say, how does that apply to my life today? Friends, it still applies to our life. The principle of the first fruit. Giving God our best and our first. Again, let's go back to the little drummer boy. What did he bring? He may not have had a ton of things, but he brought his best Friends, what about waking, waking up early, giving God the first part of your day, the first part, before the kids wake up, before the sun starts coming up, wake up and give God the first part of your day. How about giving God the first part of your monetary, your finances, giving Him the best that you have? You know, often what we do is we give God the leftovers, we give ourselves and we give the world our best and then God gets, uh, okay, I guess I can do that. But we, he says here, give God your best. In the book of Malachi, he exhorts and he rebukes the people. What they were doing in the book of Malachi is they were bringing sacrifices which were lame and broken and they were just like, they were the leftover, they were the garbage. And he says, no, God requires your best. In Matthew chapter 6, Verse 33, he says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What are we bringing to God this morning? Are we bringing him our best and our first? Friends, what does the first fruit here represent? I believe 
It represents the patriarchs of the Jewish covenant. That is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you remember? God set them apart as holy. He gave them the covenants. He said, look, I'm going to make you a nation. And through that covenant, the rest of the nation of Israel came. The rest of the nation became set apart for God's purposes. They became holy. Remember what he said about Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The lump, the first fruit, the patriarchs was holy. Then the lump, the rest of it was holy. And he goes in a little bit further now. He says, look, if the root is holy, the branches are also holy. Israel in the Bible is often depicted as an olive tree. And he expounds this idea again, the root, the patriarchs of the Jewish covenant, and then the branches are the rest of the nation. Remember chapter 10 though, what did we say? They, re they were rejecting the Messiah. So what happened? So some of the branches were broken off, right? So some of the branches fell off because remember he said, not all Israel are of Israel. Because think about it, not all of Abraham's descendants came by faith, did they? No, actually some of Abraham's descendants rejected the Messiah. They actually crucified and rejected the Messiah. Friends, this cutting off, this breaking off of the branches, that is the Israel, is only temporary. But look what happened because they were broken off. It says there were wild olive shoots being grafted in. Wild olive shoots. Now, what happened back in the day, I don't know if they really do it today, uh, but when a plant would start to die, what they would do is they would take a healthy plant and they would take branches and they would graft them in to the plant to try to get it to bear more fruit. So who are the wild olive branches? The wild, it says you. That is the church. The Gentiles are the wild olive branches. Those who were originally outside God's covenant, God's promises, we have now been grafted in to that root, to that nation of Israel as a wild olive branch. So when you see your kids running around today acting, acting crazy and you're like, you can say, you know what, you are a wild olive branch. Friends, that's what we are. That's what he says. We are wild olive branches that have been grafted in. And guess what? We get to partake in all the blessings and the promises of God. So that's sort of the analogy. But he gives us a warning. To, he gives a warning to the wild olive branches. Look at verses 18 to 20. He says, Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Here he says, look, he says a couple things. He says, I don't want you to be proud. I don't want you to boast. I don't want you to be high-minded. And I want you to fear, fear God. He says, look, he's going to say to us, wild olive branches, he says, look, don't get this twisted, okay? The root supports you. You do not support the root. And friends, in the church, there's no room for anti-Semitic type language or anti any type of anti-Semitism. Friends, we owe much to the Jewish nation because it was through the Jewish nation that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was born. Friends, we cannot take credit for any of this. Zero. It was all a work of Almighty God that he used through the Jewish nation so that salvation could come. Friends, oftentimes, you know, we can, we can get comfortable in our salvation, right? I mean, sometimes we can take it almost for granted. And oftentimes I have to be reminded of what was I before Jesus Christ? And Paul gives us a picture of what we were before Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. He says this, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, 
having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you see what he said? He said, we were separate. We were without Christ. We were strangers. We were without hope. But he said this, praise God. He said, we were brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And do you know, spiritual pride is a deadly poison that infects the church many times. You know, many people don't come to church because spiritual pride is very evident in a church sometimes. You know, they, come, they, they say, I don't want to go to church because I'm going to feel judged. You know, they think church people are way up here and I, they don't have room for somebody like me. But friends, that is totally the opposite. When we realize who we were before Jesus Christ, there's no room for this high-mindedness, this spiritual pride. And Jonathan Edwards, an old-time pastor, you may be familiar with his famous sermon. It's called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. He wrote on spiritual pride and said this, Spiritual pride is the first and worst cause of error that prevails in our day. Our day is spiritual pride. This is the main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those who are zealous for the advancement of Christ. It is the chief inlet of the smoke from the bottomless pit to darken the mind and to mislead the judgment. And the main handle by which Satan takes hold of Christians to hinder a work of God. Until the disease is cured, medicines are applied in vain to heal all other diseases. Friends, spiritual pride is the root of so many other sins. Think about pride for a moment. Think about, think about pornography for a moment. What's the root of that? Pride? Self? What about alcoholism? What's that all about? That's about self. It's about pride. What about lying and gossip? What's that all about? That's about pride, spiritual pride. That's what that's all about. And what's the cure for spiritual pride? Grace. It is grace. Friends, remember where Jesus called you out of. If you walk close to Jesus, it will smother your pride. Friends, God said that he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, when I come to realize I have nothing, I have nothing without Jesus Christ, it brings me to the point of humility, of fear, and there's no way I can become puffed up because I can say, you know what? I had absolutely nothing to do with this. It was all a work of Jesus Christ. And now Paul continues to look at this whole thing about spiritual pride, picking up in verse 21. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature in a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted in to their own olive tree? He says a lot here, but he says basically this. He says, we can never come to the point, friends, where we think we have it all together. We can never come to that point where, you know, friends, we have to realize that we have to stay connected to the vine, right? You say, I want fruit in my life. Well, Jesus gives us a principle. He says, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You want fruit in your life. You want fruit in your marriage. You want fruit in your ministry. He says, abide in me. Stay connected to me. And listen, we can never come to the point in our lives where we say, you know what? That's, that could never happen in my marriage. You know what? That could never happen to my children. You know what? That could never happen in my community. That could never happen in my life. We can never get to that point, friends. We need to continue to rely on Jesus. Paul said in Corinthians, a very unnerving verse. He says, he who thinks he stands 
take heed lest he fall. He says, don't think you have it all together because you know what? You can fall just like anyone else. We have to remember what Paul said. It's by the grace of God, there go I. Friends, it's by grace and grace alone. And he says, behold the goodness and the severity of God. For a moment this morning, think about the goodness of God in your life. Think about the good things God has done in your life. We have been grafted in and we get to partake of the blessing, of the promises of eternal life and all the good things God provides for his children. But then he says the severity. Look, he's not talking about losing your salvation. He says, look, if you continue, if you continue to reject, just like the Jewish people, if you continue to go in unbelief, he says, look, God will deal with you severely and swiftly. He says, he'll break you off. If you continue in rejecting him and continue in unbelief, and now in verse 23 and 24, again, remember the question, is God done with Israel? That's really the question. He says, he wraps up this analogy here in verse 23. It says, don't forget God is able. God is able to graft them in again. He says, look, if God could save us, the wild olive branches, if he could graft us in, he says, don't forget that God is able to graft the nation of Israel back in in due time. Friends, we can never think that somebody is too far gone that they cannot receive salvation. You know, never cast anybody out and say, you know what? They're gone. They're never going to get saved. No, we can never say that. We could continue to pray, continue to reach out. But you know, what I love about this verse is it says that God is is able. Say that with me, church. God is able. Do you know that this morning, that God is able? What is standing in your road today? What mountain is in front of you? What situation appears impossible? Friends, I want you to remember this morning that God is able. I'm not able, but God is is able. With man, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The Bible says nothing is too hard for him. Ephesians 3.20, a promise. If you have not memorized it, please memorize it. It says he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or even imagine. Friends, God is able. He can take the heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. He can repair the broken marriage. He can set the captive free. Friends, he can make a way when there is no way. When your back is against the wall, the enemy is coming in. Friends, he can part the Red Sea for you. God is able. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him. Friends, what do you need in your life today? God is able to provide it. Friends, and God is able to bring the Jewish people back together again. Friends, that's the analogy. Now the mystery. Let's look at verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of the mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have not been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on them all. That's a lot of words as well to describe what is happening to the nation of Israel. Remember, there's a partial blindness that has come upon the nation of Israel. They are rejecting the Messiah. But he says, one day that will be removed. You say, when is that day? The key verse here is verse 25. It says, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
okay? The fullness of the Gentiles. And we're going to do a quick, quick lesson on what we call eschatology or end times this morning. Real quick, it's going to be rapid fire eschatology. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? The time of the Gentiles in the scriptures began the day of Pentecost when the church was birthed. The Holy Spirit came. That began the day of Pentecost. It is continuing to this very day until until there is one Gentile out there who will be saved. And at that point, it will end. And what I believe to happen, what the Bible teaches, is that at that point, the rapture of the church will happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and left will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, to be with the Lord forevermore. And at that, play, that point, the church is gone. And what happens? It begins what the Bible teaches as the 70th week of Daniel, often known as the time of Jacob's trouble or Israel's trouble. And that will begin a period of seven years of tribulation on this earth for those who are rejecting Christ. And God is going to start to deal with his people once again, and he's going to start to draw Israel back to himself. And here at that point, the nation of Israel will make a peace treaty with a political leader known to be the Antichrist. The Bible also speaks of him as the son of perdition. And what he'll do is he's going to help the Jewish people rebuild the temple. Now, if you go and look on the internet today and you look up the the Temple Institute, you will find that the Jewish people have everything in place. They have the altar. They have the priestly line. They have the utensils. One thing stands in the way. The big thing with the gold the Dome of the Rock, that stands in the way. But friends, one day there will be a rebuilt temple on that site. And at the end, in the middle of those three and a half years, what is going to happen is the Antichrist, this political leader, is going to go into the temple and he is going to do something the Bible refers to as the abomination which causes desolation. He is going to go into that temple and he is going to demand to be worshipped to be worshipped as God. And at that point, the covenant is broken and all hell breaks loose upon the Jewish people. And at that point, there's 144,000 Jewish Billy Graham evangelists proclaiming the everlasting gospel and the blindness starts to be removed. And at the seven, end of that seven years, okay, the church comes back with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ comes back and the book of Zechariah actually tells us where Jesus Christ is going to return to. He's going to return to the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah tells us that when he lands on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split from the east to the west. He's going to walk into the Valley of Jezreel to the Battle of Armageddon and he's going to defeat the armies with what the Bible says is a double-edged sword, which he's basically, he speaks a word and it's over. That's what it talks about. And then it says we, there's going to be a thousand year millennial reign. And in Zechariah chapter 12 and 13, it's at this point, the Jewish people will really return to their Messiah. And they're going to ask Jesus this question. Where did you receive those wounds? And he's going to say, I received those wounds in the house of my friends. And at that point, friends, the blindness will be removed and the natural olive branch will be grafted right back in. Friends, that is the plan and that is the mystery which has now been revealed and we need not be ignorant of it anymore. And this analogy and this mystery now causes Paul to break forth in this wonderful doxology. Look at verses 33 to 36. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him? And it shall be repaid to him. And this is where it's it's so beautiful. For of him 
and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He goes from theology to a doxology, which simply means to praise God. And friends, as we take a step back for a moment and we hit the stop button on this trilogy and we look at it all together and view it from one moment, friends, all we have to do is say, we throw our hands up in the air and say, praise God. Praise God. He says his ways are past finding out. His wisdom is too grand. His judgments are too perfect. Only, only an all-wise, all-powerful, eternal, loving God could do something like this. His plan for salvation for both Jew and Gentile brings us to the point of worship. Only our God, only our God could take the fall of Israel and turn it in to the salvation of the world, and then bring Israel back in to get again. Only God could do that. And he says, look, it's of him. It's of him. It's all him. Look, it wasn't man's idea. It was God's idea. This salvation was a sovereign work of Almighty God. It's a work of grace. We couldn't do it. And here's the thing, friends. We wouldn't do it, even if we had a chance. But God did it. It's of Him. And then it says, it's through Him. Friends, we couldn't make it happen. We couldn't unlock the prison that we were in. Only Jesus could unlock that prison and deliver us from sin. It's only through the blood of the cross that salvation comes. It is of Him. It is through Him. And then He says, it is to Him. Friends, Yes, we receive it, but it's really not just all about us. It's for Him. It's to Him. Look, we were created for His pleasure. We find our purpose in bringing God glory. That's our purpose. It's of Him. It's through Him. It's to Him. And then he says, for to Him be the glory forever. Friends, when you meditate on this, the greatness of God, the wisdom, His plan, his love, you realize, look, I don't know that much. How awesome is God? It should make us fall down and worship and praise him for who he is. Friends, this is an analogy that shows us who we are. We are wild olive branches being grafted in. And then he shows us the mystery, the mystery of the nation of Israel. Look, he says, they're rejecting him right now, but one day in the future, in the fullness of the Gentiles has come, they will one day be grafted back in and receive that blessing. And friends, when we ponder that, as we ponder that, that should make us break forth in doxology of praise. Because salvation, my friends, is of him, it is through him, and it is to him forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We just thank you for these words, for this mystery, Lord, which you have revealed to us about the Jewish nation. Lord, but we also know, Lord, that it has much application for our own lives. Lord, we just pray that this day, it would be a day of an examination, Lord, of our own hearts as we come before the communion table today. Lord, that we would offer you our best, and our first. And Lord, as we think about what you've done for us on the cross and through the resurrection and the plan of salvation and who we were before Christ and who we are now in Christ, Lord, may our heart just erupt with praise and thanksgiving for what you've done, for who you are. Lord, help us to see Christ in greater, in deeper ways. Lord, guard us from spiritual pride, knowing, Lord, that we have absolutely nothing to do with this, but it is all a sovereign work of your amazing grace. And Father, I just pray for anybody here today who has not experienced that wonderful grace, that today would be the day they simply say, Lord, I want you to come into my heart. I've sinned. I've rebelled against you. But Lord, I, I want to change my ways. I ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins. I accept, Lord, your sacrifice 
that you paid for my sin on the cross. And I invite you today into my life to be both my Lord and my Savior, that I can receive the blessings and the promises and the richness that Jesus Christ has provided. And we pray this in your name. Amen.